So, um, so yeah, uh, welcome to our talk about the, uh, the digital cultural heritage work that we've been doing at the NCSA. Um, if, if you're unfamiliar, the NCSA is the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and we're uh, located in Urbana, Illinois, which is a couple hours drive south of Chicago. Um, so, uh, so again, just to kind of reiterate who we are, um, I'm AJ. Uh, my, my background is in uh, scientific visualization primarily. Uh, I work a lot with uh, 3D visual effects type tools, uh, the kinds of things that you would find in the Hollywood uh, filmmaking industry um, to do scientific uh, imagery. Um, and I've been doing this uh, sort of hybrid design programming work for about nine years now. And I'm Coulter. I did my undergrad in architecture at this university. And uh, I'm uh, after my year off in Cyprus uh, doing research, I'm back uh, finishing up my master's degree in architecture. Uh, I've always had an interest in real-time graphics, things like video games, and especially uh, theories in architecture and, and design and interaction have kind of informed my, uh, my design and my research interests, especially in the kind of uh, acquisition and interaction with uh, scanned digital artifacts. So, um, so yeah, so Donna Cox uh, is the director of our group. Um, she, she wants to apologize again. Uh, something came up at the last minute. Um, but uh, we've been working with her for a really long time, so we're, we're really familiar with all the materials. So um, instead of uh, going through a bunch of formalities, we'll just get right into the meat of the presentation. Uh, so um, the University of Illinois started this uh, uh, strategic relationship with the Cypress Institute uh, several years ago, uh, almost a decade ago now. Um, and uh, the Cypress Institute is a research institute based in uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, there's actually, if, if you're unfamiliar with the region, uh, Cyprus is, a, is a, an independent nation, but pre uh, it used to be a Greek island. Um, and so it's, it's sort of in the far east bit of the, of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and there are a couple big issues uh, in Cyprus uh, that they're interested in. Uh, one of which uh, is, is digital cultural heritage um, because they have a lot of cultural heritage coming from that, that ancient Greek history uh, and, and going through a lot of really interesting history, including uh, a British colonial period. Um, and, uh, and, so the, and they're also interested in, in areas like uh, 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 climate. They're interested in visualization as well. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about why uh, this... Uh, strategic partnership has, has worked out really well for us at the NCSA. So uh, before we get there, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, maybe what kind of the core work of the Advanced Visualization Lab uh, has been for, for the past uh, 20, 30 years now. Um, the idea uh, of, of our lab is basically to create cinematic treatments of supercomputer data for uh, documentary films for public outreach. Um, so you can see in this image a bunch of examples of different uh, visualizations that we've done. Um, the top left one is kind of a, a well-known example of a visualization of a tornado. Um, and then on the, on the top right, there's a visualization of the early universe and, and early forming galaxies. Uh, but the bottom left is uh, a sort of prehistoric bacteria that was one of the first examples of photosynthesis. And then the, uh, the bottom right is an example of a, a, a crowd simulation through Chicago traffic, the Chicago traffic network that was a collaboration with the Department of Transportation there. So um, these, these visualizations are done here at the Supercomputing Center because we, we rely heavily on uh, advanced networks and big data storage and uh, a massive amount of processing power to allow us to work with the data that we do work with. Um, it's, uh, it's really helpful to have access to these cores when we are uh, creating images. Um, if you're familiar with computer graphics at all, the process is called rendering, where you, you kind of take some, some 3D assets and then turn them into these beautiful images. 
Um, but, but even more than that, uh, dealing with uh, the giant amounts of data that are, are created by the, the scientists who are giving us a, a simulated galaxy or a simulated um, a, you know, macro molecule, uh, it, it is very difficult to pull off this kind of a pipeline in a different environment. And so, um, so this is why uh, we're, we're doing what we're doing at an advanced computing facility. Uh, so uh, the documentaries that we create are, are made for a variety of um, presentation formats. Some of the stuff is, is just for flat screen television. Uh, we do some streaming uh, services like Amazon Prime. Uh, we've released our documentary films there. But we've also uh, focused a lot in the past on these big immersive spaces. Uh, it's really important to us to be able to make people feel like they're inside the data. And we can really pull that off with these, uh, these theaters like uh, digital full dome theaters at Planetaria. Um, and also we've worked on a couple IMAX films that, that we do like the IMAX 3D uh, uh, format. Um, and, and one thing that I like to point out is that uh, the stereo 3D uh, like glasses that you have to wear when you go to an IMAX film, um, some people like that, some people don't, but it, it turns out it's a, it's a really great way to be able to look into complex data. It really helps you tease apart things that you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to figure out just by um, you know, flattening something onto a, a rectangular screen. So, uh, so the, the Planetaria and the, the IMAX screens are especially useful for sort of showing this kind of stuff off. Um, so this is just sort of a sampling of some of the films that we've worked on. Uh, you can see that there's kind of a heavy emphasis on astronomy in our, in our portfolio, uh, but we have also done a lot with um, geoscience, uh, which, is, which is like weather data a lot of the time, um, or or and also um, biophysics. Uh, so just to kind of give you some examples of, of some of the data sets that we've worked with, uh, this is a, a coronal mass ejection simulation. Um, this was run by a scientist named Yu Hong Fan at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, and this was part of a narrative, a part of a documentary film narrative about how these coronal mass ejection events can happen uh, uh, because of the magnetic fields on the sun and, and this plasma can basically be ejected toward the earth, uh, which could cause a lot of severe issues with global communication systems and the power grid. Um, and, and actually Donna Cox, the director of our group, was invited to present this work to, the, um, to uh, Congress in the United States uh, when a space weather bill came up before them. Um, so we, we were able to kind of help influence the outcome of that, of that legislation. Uh, so this, this data set is a tornado forming storm cloud. Uh, it's, it's a simulation of an actual tornado that uh, touched down in Oklahoma in 2011. Um, and this was such a massive data set. You can see 160 terabytes that we, we weren't even able to move it off the supercomputer and onto our local cluster for, uh, for design purposes. And so we actually had to come up with a whole new uh, chain of tools to allow us to design uh, uh, sort of remotely from, from the data and then actually run our render process on the supercomputer. And then uh, our third example, again, returning to biophysics, uh, this is a, a approximately, uh, is it a million atoms? A hundred million atom simulation of uh, a, a big molecule called a chromatophore, which is basically a, a predecessor to the chloroplast that we find in, in modern plant cells. Um, so it was, it was sort of one of the earliest uh, uh, mechanisms in biology that was able to do photosynthesis. And so this is part of a new film that we haven't released yet uh, that talks about the origins of life on Earth. And we start with a supernova and make all, our way all the way down to um, the beginnings of photosynthesis. Uh, and, and this entire uh, data set contained 100 million atoms and, and we used um, some visualization. We integrated new visualization software into our tool chain 
that allowed us to to do this thing where we're able to identify specific molecules and and uh, draw shells around sort of repeating features that are really important structurally to how this molecule is created. Um, so one of the things that's really important uh, for the work that we do here at the NCSA is um, we have to choose how we want to show the data. And so this series of four images is, is the same exact uh, time step for the same data uh, at, it just treated in different ways. And um, I apologize if it's a little bit low contrast on, on your screen, uh, so it might be a little bit harder to, to see what's going on here. But in the top left, you're kind of looking at a, uh, an interactive sort of data view where you're just kind of seeing the dots of all of the stars in this uh, pair of colliding galaxies. And, uh, and the, the bigger blue dots are indicating uh, supernova, supernovae going off inside these galaxies. Um, and then when you look to the top right, there are these uh, galaxies that we've, we've sort of extended the, the motion trails for the stars. So you can see where the stars are coming from, and that gives you much more of a sense of the motion of the galaxies. Um, and then when you look into the bottom two images, we actually introduce this gas feature, um, one of which is colored uh, sort of like you might see it photographically, and one of which is colored in such a way that you can kind of uh, follow which of the two galaxies the gas originally came from. Um, and, and these are all just different techniques to show uh, how, how we can emphasize different features in the source data. Um, and so this is, this is a whole sort of series of discoveries and tools and innovations that has, has led to uh, kind of the work that we've been doing in the digital cultural heritage space as well. So uh, on to our, our collaboration with the Cypress Institute. Um, one of the, the first sort of interactions we had with them was, was actually with their climate research group because we were able to lean on techniques that we had developed uh, with other climate researchers here at the University of Illinois. And, um, and so we were able to create, so uh, this is actually, you can kind of see behind some of the arrows, the, the island of Cyprus uh, down there in sort of the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, but the really important thing here is to kind of see the atmospheric humidity around the island of Cyprus. And, uh, and so we've drawn all these stream tubes to show the temperature and speed of the winds uh, that might be bringing humidity to the island or taking it away from the island, uh, which again is sort of a concern for them because they, they are worried that the island is becoming more of a desert over time. So, uh, so we worked with them on that sequence and on this sequence for kind of the opening of, of uh, a new facility and, uh, and sort of as an initiation to a beginning of a collaboration with their visualization team. Um, so we, we really quickly turned these visualizations around uh, sort of leveraging old tools and projects we had worked on, uh, kind of as a, just a celebration and a, a beginning to this partnership. So, um, so I'm actually, uh, this is maybe a little out of order, but I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and jump to... Uh, 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 back in the year 2013, uh, another colleague, Stuart Levy, and I traveled to Cyprus and gave a three-day three workshop on visualization. So you can see this, this photo here where we're working with some of the researchers from the Cyprus Institute, um, sharing the, the ways that we use uh, visualization to turn uh, different types of data into uh, outreach experiences for the general public. And we also touch on using visualization as an analytical tool for scientists to understand their own data. Um, so uh, so kind of going back to the beginning of our relationship with the Cypress Institute, um, the, the first sort of digital cultural heritage project we collaborated with them on was uh, uh, just a series of, of stereoscopic um, photographs kind of a stereoscopic photo album of both uh, a series of ancient tombs that, um, that the team had visited and also a bunch of mosaics, uh, sort of, you know, tiled mosaics in the ground um, that, were, that were put there thousands of years ago. Um, 
and uh, this was just sort of an exploration to see kind of how we could quantify uh, the in, the 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 culture of Cyprus as it is now and as it as it had been in the past, and also how to prevent losing some of that history that uh, that that the archaeologists there are in constant fear of 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 sort of not being able to preserve before they're taken by wind and rain and and uh you know human political issues as well so uh so then we moved on to a a, a, a sort of more uh formal project which was with these uh these cylinder seals um so for those who are unfamiliar uh the sort of one part of ancient Greek culture was was the creation of these these little cylinder seals. So these these sort of column cylinder shaped things uh, that you can see on the left those might only be the size of a, of a grape. Um, they're they're very small, uh, and so these extremely talented artisans would would carve into these cylinders uh, very unique patterns that that wealthy uh, Cypriots could then use to roll a cloth across clay uh, and sort of use it as a personal signature. It was their personal mark. Um, and it was sort of a, a, a symbol of being high class and, and, uh, and every, um, every person had a unique cylinder seal. And there are some really cool features that are, that are hidden in these cylinder seals. Uh, but there's sort of this big issue uh, when trying to communicate the importance of the cylinder seals uh, in that they're extremely small. And so if you set up a, a display at a museum with cylinder seals, the visitors to the museum will pass by them almost every time because they just don't look interesting. So uh, we started collaborating with another researcher here at the University of Illinois uh, named Wayne Petard who had been uh, doing these, these full three-dimensional scans of the cylinder seals, um, which you can kind of see the, the process of them doing that on the right. And, uh, and then we got these really high-resolution images. And uh, another colleague in our group, Jeff Carpenter, worked on creating a multimedia experience that they could project on a large touch screen uh, at, at uh, a museum. So this is this is kind of the uh, the canvas then that Jeff was given to work with, and he was able to use image processing tools to pull apart the different characters that were on the cylinder seal, and then use uh, the animation software Flash to to create a story for these these different characters because the archaeologists are are able to tell us that there is a story embedded in this in this art. Um. So, so once we had sort of gone through that process, uh, we started trying to get a little bit more ambitious. Uh, and we, we have this tool that we use for a lot of our astronomy visualization called Virtual Director, um, which uh, you can see here. This is sort of a, a, a exploration of a galaxy data set. And um, you can see Bob Patterson, our, our lead artist on the team on the left, is, is using a 3D mouse to fly a, a dome avatar into the galaxy. And it's dropping these yellow boxes as keyframes uh, on, on his path into the galaxy. So we like using Virtual Director uh, both for data exploration and also for uh, rendered movie um, choreography to, to choreograph the camera pads through the scenes. So, so Virtual Director has its uh, origins back in the 90s. Uh, it was a, a virtual reality tool back then. And although it's on a flat screen, it's still considered a virtual reality tool today. Um, originally, it was in a, a, a cave environment, which if you're unfamiliar, is, is uh, three walls and a floor um, that were projected uh, with, with stereoscopic 3D imagery. Um, and you could walk inside of the data. Again, sort of this idea that understanding data works better when you're in an immersive space. Um, and so that's, that's the environment that Virtual Director was developed for. Um, and, and it was also created to connect uh, different caves and different research facilities together inside the same data. And that persists today. So we still have this ability to collaborate remotely 
Um, you're seeing kind of a live interaction here between the supercomputing center in Urbana and the planetarium in Chicago. So we wanted to take some of those abilities and, and move them into the, the cultural heritage space. Um, so we worked with Cyprus to get this 3D scan of a mosaic into the space. And, and it was cool. We were able to fly around inside of it. Um, the, the image that you're seeing here is actually a, a 3D point cloud. Um, so there's lots of, of little dots here that when you pull away far enough, just looks like a solid surface. But this is actually a, just a collection of 3D colored points in space. Um, and, and the idea of, of doing this exercise uh, was, was to explore. So, so this, this mosaic came from a church. Uh, one, one thing that I think Coulter will talk a bit more about is, is uh, a political issue in, in the country of Cyprus, uh, where it's divided kind of north and south between uh, Greek, sort of culturally Greek Cypriots and culturally uh, Turkish Cypriots. And uh, the, the island was only divided about 40 years ago, maybe 45 years ago now. Um, and, uh, and so there's sort of a lot, still a lot of sort of recent memory of the event. Um, and one of the big uh, issues that happened in relation to cultural heritage at the time that the, the nation split was that everyone sort of scrambled to grab what they could in the way of artifacts. And so a lot of uh, uh, artifacts were removed from the original environments in which they uh, belonged. And so this mosaic belonged in this church. And so what we're trying to do in this collaboration is use these uh, virtual tools to reconstruct an environment that used to exist in the real world. And the, ar the archaeologists are able to come into this virtual space and try to use their knowledge of of you know either photographs or what things probably would have been been done by the architects and put them together and sort of explore how how things used to be and and preserve the past um so uh sort of in in doing that we realized that there would be a lot of value in being able to interact in that virtual space together at the same time and so we worked very closely with the cypress institute in in specking out a lab that was very similar to our own uh, so that we were able to use the same tools and explore the data uh, together. And so um, that led to this collaboration where we're working in an ancient theater in Cyprus uh, and, and we're able to uh, see each other in the environment. Um, we're able to uh, move around. We're also able to move objects around. And the, the image you can see here in the bottom left was sort of a, uh, a simplified interface on an iPad that allowed uh, non-expert users of the, of the virtual reality tool to still be able to move themselves and move objects in the world um, and feel empowered in that, in that virtual environment. So that's kind of the history. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Coulter to talk about the, the ongoing collaborations that we have with the Cypress Institute. Okay, so, oh, actually, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, just a couple notes. Uh, I forgot about these slides. Um, so just uh, some, some future collaborations that we're looking at are uh, this Koirokotia site in Cyprus, which is an ancient village. Um, we're, we're talking about uh, kind of recreating a virtual environment from this. Uh, and then we're also talking about something much closer to home for us in Urbana uh, are the Cahokia Mounds which was sort of an ancient uh, uh, Native American civilization that uh, at the time it existed uh, was about the same size or bigger actually than the civilization uh, in London in Europe. Um, so uh, so these, these two different sites are, are actually quite similar in terms of what you might need to do to create a, a large uh, uh, fabricated environment in virtual reality to be able to explore the kinds of research questions that archaeologists are interested in. So now to Coulter. Okay, uh, so when I was brought onto the project, the team was looking to uh, work with more real-time graphic technologies. So we, they were looking at Unity 3D, a video game engine, um, as well as virtual reality displays and new modes of interaction to begin to, to play with that data outside of Virtual Director. Um, and I was brought on as a SPIN student in 2013 to help with that, to pick up this new technology and play in the new space. 
Um, so of course, I mentioned before my my interests. Um, I found a really good group to work with as an intern because my interest is kind of like the intersection of architecture, technology, uh, and interaction. Uh, so kind of considering how we interact with uh, with technology and how we learn from it um, and, and use it in our, in our day-to-day lives. Um, so uh, I want to begin to talk about how the kind of scope for analysis uh, with Reveal 3D uh, kind of expanded over time. So we began to think about um, the, the history of excavation and, and uh, kind of ingesting of media about excavation. So here you'll see in this, this image, uh, they, the archaeologists would trace out or plot out found artifacts and, and kind of get these series of pages describing what they found, uh, as well they would trace or photograph objects in, in different views. And this is a way to sort of catalog and archive what was found in an excavation. Um, but in, more recently, a lot of technologies have emerged and have begun uh, employment in excavation because they can be faster, they can have higher fidelity. Um, so this is one technology that we used in, in our pilot project called photogrammetry. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but more recently, um, there's been uh, kind of software kits that can kind of synthesize hundreds or thousands of structured photographs into accurate three-dimensional models of geometry. So you can be scanning either objects that have been isolated from an excavation site, or as we were experimenting, uh, we were trying to use uh, drones as well as standing cameras to capture larger areas, so the entire ex excavation site. And this is a really cool technology because it's using sort of everyday or, or more accessible uh, cameras like DSLRs. Um, and it's very quick. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively quick process. So in, in Cyprus, uh, as you'll see on the right, this is a, a, an aqueduct. Um, there are many excavation sites which are revealed in the process of construction. So they'll tear up a road and put pipes down uh, for new plumbing and um, they'll discover something like a 14th century monastery. And excavation sites need to have a quicker turnaround so that these excavation sites can be returned to the urban fabric as it's used day to day. Um, so this is one technology that uh, has been investigated for sort of high fidelity, quick capturing of excavation sites um, as sort of a base uh, on which you can sort of place other scanned artifacts. So some other technologies that the Cypress Institute uses to capture sites, these are different forms of media and different technologies of scanning. So they use a laser scanner. Um, and we actually used a laser scanner in 20, early 2017 to create a point cloud version of Kirokatiya. Um, so they'll create kind of dense point clouds that can represent a larger environment. Um, and uh, they're kind of like a, a patchwork of a bunch of different scans using a, a rotating uh, LIDAR scanner. Um, they'll also use uh, spherical panoramas. So in a place like a church where art is on all the walls and they can have kind of interrelationship, the spherical panorama can capture a 360 degree view. Um, and that view can uh, offer a lot more information than a single photograph. Uh, so people can look at in different directions and kind of compare things within a space. And the last one, uh, and apologies because the text isn't quite clear, uh, is RTI imaging. So they can use cameras in a similar way to photogrammetry, but uh, use, uh, I guess, structured light to, to capture um, a larger amount of surface detail uh, than, than a traditional photograph would. So they can get etchings, uh, graffiti, or even material details out of small objects or, or sections of environments uh, where they can start to pull out more details than can even be seen with the naked eye. Um, so archaeologists have been, or they've started to, to, to ingest and create all of this specific, uh, special and specific media for, for different uses in, in um, I guess, capturing or, or encountering uh, an excavation site. Uh, so it's a lot more uh, it's a lot more different types of media and a different different formats two dimensional three dimensional or with special files uh, than uh, what, what was traditional just drawings and regular photographs. So we wanted to consider that entire uh, pipeline from excavation to uh, media creation and ingestion, uh, and that begins with uh, a space where the archaeologists can upload their data. So the uh, the NCSA worked uh, to create a smart uh, database, smart online database, where uh, media can be ingested from all these different scanning techniques. Um, 
and accessed in kind of non nonlinear ways. So uh, this is a sort of database ontology where all these different uh, forms of media, commentary, and information can be uploaded into one place and accessed. Uh, and this, is, this sort of reflects a broader move in archaeology away from a sort of rigid hierarchical model uh, of cataloging and organizing artifacts based on uh, regular details, dates, and, and other assumed information into a more nonlinear tagged based model. So uh, an archaeologist could find an artifact, scan it, and begin to tag it with details that they, um, that they understand about the object. They're not forced to kind of slot an object into a, a single category because many objects kind of uh, become kind of crosshatched in, in different, uh, different categories. Um, and this is an example. So this is an example of uploading data onto Clouder, which is our shared uh, online database. Uh, we've uploaded project files for access on, on Clouder between our teams. Um, so to jump more specifically into our use of Unity 3D to visualize this media, uh, this is Nicosia Cyprus. It's like the capital city. Uh, it was divided in half. Uh, so you're, you're seeing, or I'll jump into this one. Um, if you see this green line that cuts through the city, that's the, the green buffer zone. Uh, so that's what separates the northern half of Cyprus from the southern half. Um, as well, this, this blue kind of squiggly line around the city, th that's the medieval bastion that was erected to keep the city safe from invaders. Um, so what you're seeing inside the blue is like the old part of Nicosia. The green line cuts it in half. And the red circle that's been highlighted is our like kind of area of concentration for our excavation site. It's the Paphos Gate, which is kind of a tunnel that transitions from the inside to the outside of the bastion wall. Um, this is kind of a closer view of the Paphos Gate site in Unity 3D. Um, so the areas in the red outline, are, that's the kind of UN buffer zone, which is inaccessible. Um, and you'll see the label number one, that, that's the proper excavation site, the aqueduct that used to lead into the city for water, um, as well as like a moat before. Uh, and then you'll see this like kind of straight line that cuts across under number six, that's the bastion wall. You'll notice that a little bit north of that is uh, the, when the British occupied the area, they kind of cut through the wall. So I guess the Paphos Gate has always sort of represented uh, a boundary condition, even today. And uh, as the um, north and southern sides of Cyprus, if they reunify, this area is going to be like a very important kind of transition point. So it'll be very like an area of kind of economic and cultural activity. So the site's being investigated both for its like historical and future developments. Um, I'll jump ahead again. Uh, so this is another view from inside Unity 3D. Uh, we have up top the, the Paphos gate. So this is like looking into the gate between those two steps. On top is a police station. And then the bottom image is the, the moat aqueduct area in the back, which is like a good uh, meter or two lower than the street level. Oh, if you're not familiar with Unity 3D, it's um, a video game engine. It's uh, kind of open development. Uh, it's used for a lot of in develop, uh, independent video games. It's been used for cinematics. Um, and it's been a really uh, beneficial space to work in because you just you can program functions in, in C Sharp. You get a lot of uh, plugins uh, directly from virtual reality and uh, Kind of immersive technologies. They, they write plugins that go right into Unity so you can be, begin to use and experiment with uh, these new interfaces pretty easily. Um, as well, it's got uh, well-developed graphics uh, technology so we get real-time lighting and shadows uh, and support for high-resolution textures from our scans. Um, here are two images that represent these sort of two phases and in interactions. So back in 2013 and 14 we were using the original Oculus Rift, uh, which was one of the first VR headsets on the market, as well as a device called the Leap Motion, which uh, basically used infrared sensors to, to scan the position of the hands in front of the sensor. Uh, we were able to get the hands as a model inside the virtual environment as you wore the VR headset, and you kind of pinched, or you kind of held your hands out and like pinched to rotate, you pinched to click on objects, and you could kind of pinch to manipulate them. Um, we were up to the second Oculus Rift, so we had moved to a, a newer version, but 
uh, the Oculus Rift had a kind of limited uh, environment for positioning your body and your head. So we were very excited when the HTC Vive came out in, I think, uh, 2016. We, we got a, a, a unit in Cyprus, uh, which allows for room scale tracking. So you're basically in an area of three meters by three meters, and you can walk around uh, inside of that in physical space. As well, the HTC Vive uses a tracked controller set, and we found the, the hand controller uh, was a little bit more uh, easy for people to, to use than the sort of like gesture-based system with the leap motion. So with our HTC system, uh, you kind of hold the remote out, and there's a kind of arc that comes out of the controller, and it, it lands on the ground. If you click down, then you kind of instantly teleport to the position that the arc is landed in. Um, you can also access a kind of laser pointer and click on objects and drag them around and manipulate them in the space. So you can kind of inspect objects that have been scanned separately and placed into the excavation site. As well, we use the kind of laser pointer system to uh, allow users to interact with GUIs. Uh, so on the right page, uh, or sorry, on the right image, you're seeing kind of a scroll down menu where you can see the site in different phases. Um, we've been using the kind of spatial configuration of the site as a way to uh, reconstruct past versions of the site. So say in the 1960s or the 1800s, uh, as well as uh, future visions of what the site could be given redevelopment for tourism. Um, so this is an example of a, a future vision of the site. So given uh, the accurate three-dimensional scanning, we kind of fed that information into an architectural modeling program and use that to plan out a sort of path that travels from the bottom of the gate up back up to the street above. Um, and we were able to kind of consider the shape of that path and the travel through that path in context with the excavation site as it exists and what people would see um, and consider what you kind of lose when you cover it with the path. So we're able to make a very informed decision about uh, what, the what the kind of uh, intervention could look like we also use the VR headset to show our intention to the Cypriot municipality. Um, and it gave us uh, kind of funding opportunities uh, and I guess influence into the process of how that site is developed in the future. Uh, we also used uh, the site as um, a virtual space for testing crowd simulation models and agent-based modeling. So we were uh, interested in seeing uh, given the site opening up more to tourism in the future, what, uh, what, what people or how crowds behave as they travel through the site from one end to the other or, or through the gate. Um, and we had a separate researcher in Cyprus who was working on crowd recording and simulation and Unity was a, a very advantageous place to kind of do that, that agent-based uh, modeling and, and view it in real time, even in VR. Um, so I guess in, in general, uh, is there another slide? Oh, here we go. So sorry, uh, we had the crowd simulation, then we have kind of our future steps with the Reveal 3D app. Um, we are interested more generally in getting the information, the media, and what we create out to the public um, and get it kind of untethered from the VR, the desktop environment of display. Uh, we were really inspired by uh, the app the phone app Pokemon Go. Uh, I think that was in 2016, 2017, uh, where it was kind of placing game objects in a real environment using GPS and, and users were accessing and interacting with those uh, objects uh, by walking around in real space. Uh, we thought that uh, as these excavation sites are processed, the best and most important items are removed from those sites. And more generally in Cyprus, there's a problem where uh, important artifacts have been removed and transported to other countries to, to live in museums there. Um, and so we thought if we have an augmented reality app, uh, you could take artifacts, you could take reconstructions in specific media and tag those objects by their GPS location back to the original site. And as users would walk around the old city, they would be prompted to uh, view and read uh, about artifacts that existed in the site uh, as it was in the past as well. Um, in this, uh, this was a video, these are stills from a video. Uh, we had taken our site and rebuilt it as it was in the 1960s as a full 360 degree panorama. Um, 
And the idea was if you were to stand in the correct position and load that panorama, you could kind of look around you um, and see the site as it was. Uh, we also got a large book uh, full of old photographs of the city before it got all of its contemporary development. And we started to take those old photographs, scan them and place them in the approximate position where the photos were taken. So as you would come up to a position where there was sort of a, a lineup between what you were seeing today and what, hap what existed in the past, you could kind of get this more intuitive, um, intuitive uh, engagement with, with how history uh, occurred, how the city has changed over time. Um, and so th that's sort of the space that we are continuing to develop, uh, moving towards mobile and moving towards augmented reality for more public engagement. 